All right, folks, welcome back. Matt Barton once again, this time to talk about studying video games. This is the uh, focused on the first chapter, of course, of our textbook, Understanding Video Games. Go ahead and read the chapter if you haven't already uh, before you watch this lecture. Uh, but here I'll be trying to give some personal perspectives on the chapter, maybe some more examples to help you uh, understand and dig into this material. Uh, but there's also going to be some questions periodically where I'll turn the, the tables and let you uh, tell me what you think about these things. So now let's go ahead and get started here. In theory, at least. Let's see, can we get to the next slide? Yes, <laughs> here we go. Oh, the wonders of PowerPoint. Okay, so here are the learning objectives for today. We'll be talking about who studies video games. What kind of people are these? Uh, what kind of academics are we talking about here? Uh, and then how do you study video games or how do they go about it? You know, how do you do this work? And what types of analysis are available? As we'll see, there are many different ways to approach this problem. Uh, problem? I don't know, maybe opportunity. And then what are the various schools of thought or sort of fundamental philosophies or outlooks that people take uh, within the game studies discourse community? And so that's hopefully by the end of this uh, lecture, you have a better answer for these questions. Uh, for now, though, let's turn to the, before the first chapter, there's an introductory section where they, uh, the authors lay out sort of the big questions of game studies. And I thought it would be fun to start with these. And so our first question, for you anyway, is what is a game? How do you define this term? What makes something a game as opposed to something else like a sport or a story or a film? What is unique? Uh, so anyway, ponder on that for a while, come back, and then we'll continue. Okay, so if you had a hard time with that question, hopefully you didn't just go to uh, to Google and <laughs> type in the uh, definition there from the Merriam-Webster. Uh, most people struggle with this. You know, maybe they'll say something like it's something that you do for fun, it's something with rules, you know, something along those lines. Uh, but as we'll see, game scholars themselves do not agree on one definition for this. People tend to have their own definitions for specific purposes. And you think, well, that's a little bit weird, shouldn't it? You know, if anybody should be able to define game, it should be somebody out there calling themselves a game study, a game studies professor. <laughs> uh, but it's really not unusual. You know, I'm sure you've taken any number of classes where the first question, first lecture is exactly that. Like you take a philosophy class, the question is, what is philosophy? You take a class on cultural studies, they might ask you, what is culture? And that can be the whole theme of the class is just trying to answer that question. What's the difference between society and culture? And what do we mean by um, history? You know, what is this thing we call history? <laughs> so it's really not unusual that the practitioners or the experts within this field themselves wouldn't have a common uh, definition for it. I said, so don't feel bad if you struggled as well. Uh, however, when we are writing a paper, doing a study, uh, we do have a specific definition, sort of a working definition of what we'll, what we mean by a game, at least in the context of that paper. So we might say, you know, in the context of this course, uh, when I say the word video game, I'll be talking about blank. <laughs> Not saying that that's a, that definition would apply universally or for any situation, but just, at, you know, in the situation at hand, uh, this is what I mean by the term. And, of course, that's very common. Uh, so here's an example I pulled from game studies, uh, one of the game studies uh, journal articles you may have looked at last time. Uh, so this is from an article called Strategy in Games or Strategy Games, Dictionary and Encyclopedic Definitions for Game Studies by Simon Dorr. Uh, so he quotes someone named Goodfellow here. He says, we need better terminology, of course, but as evolutionary as language is, you just can't impose it. For better or worse, the term RTS, real-time strategy, has come to mean a, quote, top-down game in which you gather resources to build and control armies of little guys. <laughs> Sometimes it makes sense to just defer to the popular understanding. Uh, so that's a really good example of this. I mean, uh, little guys uh, doesn't really sound all that formal or academic, but... Uh, Goodfellow's saying that, you know, sometimes it just makes sense just to go with that 
definition, go with that understanding because we'll sort of tie ourselves into knots. <laughs> and believe me, I've experienced with this. If you start trying to define explicitly what you mean by real-time strategy, uh, that, ends up, that ends up becoming the whole paper. Uh, you don't get around to what, what it is you're trying to say. Uh, this happened to me in my Dungeons and Desktops book when I'm trying to say, what is a role-playing game? And what, what makes a computer role-playing game different than an adventure game, strategy game? You know, so I know what Goodfellow is talking about here. And so anyway, that's kind of a fun thing to think about. Just what is a video game? And beyond that, what do we mean by adventure game? What's an action game and so on? Uh, second big question, why are there games? Why do we find games in every culture, every society, anywhere you go around the world, people are playing these things. Why is that? Now, so again, you might have had an answer similar to these. Uh, most people answer the questions along the lines of uh, evolution. Let's say it, play, it must play, these games must play some kind of evolutionary role. Yeah, they say that uh, we can practice important skills in relative safety. So you can think about playing a game of chase. Uh, or, you know, it makes a lot of sense if you think about some of the sports where you're, oh, I don't know, beyond physical fitness, football, for example, or hockey. You know, there might be elements of that that would translate into sort of a battlefield or hunting scenario. <laughs> you know, I'm not quite sure how that works. But maybe if you go far enough back, uh, there's some kind of evolutionary reason for games. Uh, maybe people who were really good at chess, you know, ended up ended up conquering more territory. Who knows? Uh, so there are those kinds of arguments that would explain, like, why does everybody play games? But it doesn't really get at the bigger question of uh, why... Okay, let me just say I'll buy that, that we needed gaming for some kind of biological, you know, back in the uh, Neolithic time, Paleolithic, whatever. People needed to protect themselves from the tiger and get food and so on. Uh, but still, if that's true, maybe, but why are there so many different kinds of games out there? And why is there so much disagreement about that's a good game or that's a waste of time? Uh, some people think gaming itself is just a big waste of time. Uh, other people think this is really a, it's really useful. I mean, it's, if you're playing games like chess, for example, you might be, it's not just for fun, you might be actually developing your brain somehow. Uh, and people say that about video games as well. And so there's a lot of discussion all around these, this question as well. Uh, which brings us to the third question. So why do some people prefer certain games? Do certain types of games appeal to people in certain times and cultures, and if so, why? So just in a parallel here would be sports. Why is it that soccer is so popular just about everywhere else? But here, you know, and here it's all about football. Or in St. Cloud State, or in Minnesota anyway, it's maybe more about, or Canada might be more about uh, uh, hockey. So we find that in sports, and we also find that in games. You know, there was an explosion in Singapore, I think it was Singapore, no, Korea, I'm sorry, South Korea, around the game of StarCraft II. So this became, it was not just a game there, it became a cultural phenomenon, an, an e-sport, uh, if you will. Uh, but we know you have different groups of friends who prefer different kinds of games. Uh, just so why is that? Why, do, why are you drawn to one type of game instead of another? So a little discussion of this question. Uh, so there have there has been efforts to link cultural events to certain kinds of games, and I'm always I always think about sports too. There, there's sort of explanations. Well, they like uh, soccer, for example, is kind of more of a uh, is more uh, less about individuals and, and well-defined roles, uh, like with football. Uh, I've even heard things about uh, soccer, like well, the breaks, the commercial breaks, don't work out so well with soccer. So that's one reason why it's not as popular as football in the U.S., where the televised aspect is so important. Uh, so you can get into things like that. Now, I also teach a course called Rhetoric of Popular Culture, and I usually focus on The Walking Dead, just kind of as the, the case study as we go along. And we see there how the at certain points in history, if there's a war going on or there's big concerns, like right now we have all these uh, concerns in the media, about immigration, let's say, 
Uh, so we, we, the, the argument is that if there is kind of a big cultural concern like that, it tends to appear sort of a disguised form in the recreational activities. So the movies we watch, the games we play. And so there could be some kind of tie there. It's a really fascinating, but, you know, again, the authors say it's a lot of, a lot of this is speculation. There's not a lot of hard science, at least as of yet, to explain why this might be. And then the final big question is, how do games affect the player? So you might have heard questions like this. Do violent games make players violent? Uh, do zero-sum games make people less cooperative in real life? So zero-sum zero game is kind of a technical term, but I just think about this. If you play video games, you know that some games are co-op uh, and some games are competitive. So for example, chess, is a competitive game, right? It's a zero-sum game. You either win or you lose, and you win or lose at the other person's expense. Or Magic the Gathering, the card game, the same type of deal, right? Uh, but there's these other games called co-op games where you're kind of all working together. You know, I think about something like World of Warcraft, for example, where you're doing these uh, raids or instances, and you're, you sort of all win or lose together in that context, right? So that's be more cooperative game. I'm trying to think of some board games that might fit. It seems like board games tend to be mostly of the uh, zero-sum type. You know, I'd have to think for a while if I could think of a cooperative. And a certain sort of card games, for example, you might have, uh, might be working together to get through the deck and make pairs or whatever. <laughs> but anyway, hopefully you get the point. Uh, and then can games teach children useful skills? So, we're, again, are they just wasting time with these games? Or maybe there's some educational opportunities there. So just the big question, how do games affect the player? Uh, ponder on that. What do you think? Do you think that has a strong effect, no effect? You know, should this should be concerned? Uh, what are your thoughts on it? And then the uh, broader discussion around this, again, you know, the authors said a lot of, a lot of opinions, basically, a lot of pseudoscience, a lot of very authoritative sounding experts. <laughs> but again, the, there's not a whole lot of hard data uh, to back up these assertions. Even something like this question that always comes up about, you know, the, uh, you know, the kids are playing these super uber, incredibly gory, violent games. Uh, how it, maybe that's causing uh, these uh, real life violence, these school shootings and all these tragedy, tragedies happening. Uh, but, you know, beyond, you know, it might sound convincing, uh, the arguments that are made pro and con are too, uh, you know, for and against that. But when we look at, like, what does the actual data say? You know, and how are they, how have you conducted these studies? There's not a whole lot of conclusive evidence either way. Typically, it's a bit of a wash, you know, that, you know, if you think about it, common sense as well, I would say. <laughs> I mean, think about how much money has been invested and in expertise invested in television commercials. And yet, I probably don't even care about 90% of the ads and commercials I look at. Uh, it certainly isn't the case that I rush out and buy whatever I see in a commercial. And, you know, so why should it be that, a, you know, a video game should have that sort of immediate impact on me, make me want to go out and do something in real life? You know, I think most of us no, like, this is a game, <laughs> this is real life. <laughs> you know, it's not difficult. But, you know, maybe there's more to it than that. Uh, so the bulk of this course will, the bulk of this course will strive to help you understand how games affect you. Uh, so that's really what we're getting at. Instead of thinking about games in a generic, one-size-fits-all kind of thing, you know, if you play this episode of uh, Life is Strange, you know, how does that, what kind of effect does that have on you? How does it make you feel? And what can you glean uh, about your own decision-making process, your own personality by uh, going through that experience and reflecting on it? You know, I think that's a lot more useful than just trying to assert, well, everybody that plays this game is going to do this and have this kind of impact on their uh, behavior. It doesn't really line up. Uh, so some reasons to study video games. You know, we've talked about this a little bit already. Uh, but one of the obvious ones is the financial side of this. You know, we went over that last time. Big 
profits, huge games, bigger than Hollywood, much bigger. Uh, there's uh, an industry this size. There's a lot of concerns about uh, the work hours and the, you know, all the same stuff you would see in any big industry. You know, of course, there's no shortage of uh, bad actors there. A lot of long hours. Uh, in video games development in the industry, there's this uh, long reputation for the uh, crunch time. Uh, they call it the crunches. Uh, so they might have people there just working these ridiculously long hours, especially towards the end of a, a video game project. And it makes it hard to have a, you know, to balance that with a family, you know, family life and so on. It can be unhealthy, frankly, even to keep up basics, uh, fitness <laughs> and, and nutrition. Uh, one of my good friends who's uh, been part of the video game industry basically since the 70s, really. Uh, her nickname is uh, Becky Burger. The reason they call her that is that she didn't, basically didn't have time to go out and get any food, so she'd just go off like once a week and get a big bag of uh, burgers from the local, uh, what's the name of it, I think In-N-Out Burger, and just keep those in her desk. And just when she'd get hungry, she'd have one of these burgers. <laughs> it kind of, kind of freaked everybody else out, I guess. But, you know, that you know is that right? Is that what we want? Uh, so there is some room there, I think, for some critical perspectives on this how these games were getting made. Uh, beyond that, the cultural and aesthetic... Uh, considerations you know this we don't really you don't really have to make an argument as and if I said this course is about Shakespeare we'll be reading uh, Shakespeare plays uh, or this is a music class we'll be listening to Bach and Mozart and, you know there's not many people that would seriously say well that doesn't deserve to be studied you know Shakespeare <laughs> that's just some plays <laughs> you know who cares I mean maybe like a you know a very naive person a person without any sophistication might say something like that uh, but somebody with a little bit more of a, you know, culturally literate, shall we say, you know, that would be kind of a given. Like, well, of course you should read that. That's one of the best, greatest, most celebrated works of uh, music or uh, literature or whatever. You know, and you might not subscribe to that view, but, you know, basically the argument is here that games have kind of approached that level. Or maybe they've even surpassed it. Who knows? But you know, if you don't have any problem studying films, that was kind of controversial not so long ago, too. You know, Citizen Kane, who cares? It's just another movie. <laughs> Gone with the wind. <laughs> That's not worth studying. You know, we need to be studying uh, Homer. I think it's it's fun when you really look at this question that there's people out there still that say it's not it's not literature if it's not if you're not reading it in the original Greek. <laughs> what? Yeah, it's, you know, only like Homer and uh, the Iliad and things like that are really literature. Uh, all this other stuff is garbage. And then within that, you get these these folks who are like, American literature, that's an oxymoron. You know, this, America hasn't been around nearly long enough to have literature. You know, and it just kind of gets, their, you know, the elitism basically gets starts to run rampant really quick here. Uh, but anyway, the point could be just as simple, simple as we're not talking about Oh, uh, you know, Pac-Man or Pong or something. You know, there's games now with a lot more, lot very, you know, very multi-layered. Uh, there's a series out now about The Witcher. You say, well, that was a book, and then it became a game. You know, and probably the books, I'm sure the novels are wonderful. I haven't read them, uh, but I've certainly played the games, and I think, yeah, these, these are very sophisticated, a lot of drama, uh, easily as much going on in there as you see in most television shows so uh, anyway that's another reason uh and then finally interactivity you know this could be a reason to study games right they do have this unique feature uh you you make decisions when you play games right and that's you're balancing resources there's some kind of way usually to win it or to lose it or at least to do better at it and so this there's a kind of a dimension in games that that's again one of these terms is hard to define but interactivity so you don't really interact with a novel or a film or a music piece the same way you do with a game. Now, there's something unique about this, so maybe that's cool enough in and of itself to warrant studying video games and, or any kind of game, and how does it work? You know, maybe this is uh, something that's really revolutionary about games. You know, this could be, you know, maybe if you took this course 100 years from now, uh, this might seem like... Uh, you know, maybe the video game is just so ubiquitous and considered the, you know, the cultural medium uh, par excellence. 
All right, so who studies video games? Yeah, this is a good question. Like, what is a game studies career all about? What if you want to become a professional? What if you want to be become an academic and dedicate yourself to video games? How do you go about that? Uh, what kind of discipline uh, do you need to be from? And, of course, there are universities that offer Ph.D. programs in game studies or some variation of games and simulations, you know, something like that. Uh, but really, game studies at its heart is multi disciplinary and so what that means is there's not just one discipline game studies that everybody goes to programs in uh, rather there's a lot it's kind of a smorgasbord I would say of different uh, faculty members different kinds of professors different kinds of researchers uh, there's a lot of uh, members your game studies uh, practitioners whatever you want to call them that go to a film studies program and they find a lot of the stuff that applies to film since it's an audio visual medium there's there's sound there's animation a lot of that applies to video games so it makes sense uh, that you would have people that you know move from film into video games uh, there's also folks that do literature there's a lot of uh, text in games a lot of stories narratives so that's pretty obvious why that would be uh, but there are also folks from communication studies there's you know think about gaming as a form of communication not just you know over the headsets, but the ways the games communicate ideas. Uh, sociology, again, kind of an obvious one. Games are playing such a big role in society and culture. Of course, you would want folks with that kind of perspective. Uh, then you also have computer scientists, and uh, this the really the cool thing is the professional game designers. So this is kind of unique in terms of academic uh, fields. There's usually you don't see the uh, folks from the industry in the same groups or in the same circles as the academics. You know, if, if you're in film studies, you don't have like producers of film uh, coming to the conferences and conventions. You know, that that's just totally, it's totally different, distinct. That's a different world. <laughs> uh, but in games, if you go to say like the computer, uh, what is it, the uh, Game Development Convention, GDC, Game Developers Conference, this is the only thing I know like this. So if you go to GDC, Yes, you, you might see talks there from people that make games and they're talking about, oh, here's this latest thing in Unity. Uh, here's this breakthroughs in 3D animation. So you will see that kind of stuff. But alongside, there will be these academics there uh, who are talking about games from a you know, very academic perspective, as we'll get into throughout this course. And a lot of those same folks that went to the Unity thing will be there listening to the academics talk. And then a lot of these academics, the game designers, will make games. Uh, so there's, there's not this like clear distinction between between somebody who studies games, uh, like you know take art, you know yeah like art historians and art critics, uh, but they might may or may not have anything to do with actual artists. Right? I mean they never painted anything, and there's not even that expectation that they would you know care about something like that. Uh, whereas with uh, game studies, there does tend to be this nice uh, I'd call it maybe a synergy. So hopefully that will continue. All right, so how do you study video games? What are the different methods out there, the different perspectives? And we've already, already kind of touched on this. You know, it depends on, I guess, your background. Uh, there's not a lot of, uh, at least as of yet, a lot of elitism. You know, if you want to take a, if you have a cultural studies background, you want to apply that, uh, that's fine. Uh, if you have uh, a different expertise, that's probably fine as well you know people that just want to like <laughs> whatever works whatever helps us to understand games you know, we're not going to uh, shut you out but there are these five main types of analysis I think are useful to think about uh, one is the games themselves right so you can look at a game whether that be Grand Theft Auto whether that be uh, Fortnite and you could just talk about the game as a game like how is it put together how does it work uh, what are the techniques, the mechanics, you know, what can you do in this game? Uh, how do the resources work? Uh, how does the interface work? Is it team-based? You know, is it cl collaborative or competitive? You know, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, what does that mean? Uh, so if a game is co-op, uh, how does that change the, the nature of the game? And so that might fall into this category of just looking at the games. Uh, the other type focuses in on the players. Uh, so we're less concerned about the game itself as the people playing it. 
like looking at maybe uh, they talked about some studies where they I think it was Star Wars Galaxies over they were going in and looking in the cantinas and trade chats and things and seeing how people are communicating with each other uh, these groups of players uh, you know how are you using gaming uh, there was a phenomenon not too long ago with the Farmville <laughs> if you remember that or Pokemon Go is another one uh, where it's like the game is interesting but it's kind of, it's also interesting to think about how people are the, you know people playing Pokemon Go and they're out it's you know they said Pokemon Go is great because it's getting people outside right it's getting these kids out and socialize <laughs> in the social space and so that'd be an example there of like yeah we, maybe you wouldn't even really talk about the game you won't talk about the people playing the game uh, and then you could extend that to, or expand that into this cultural domain, where instead of just talking about individual players or groups, you're talking about the culture as a whole. You know, this big culture of people who, and we talked about South Korea and their uh, StarCraft II eSport. Like, this is a, not just a little group of players. I mean, this is the whole country, basically. Everybody's into this. It's uh, just as big, if not bigger, than football or hockey uh, is here. And I mean, they, they do a lot more than StarCraft II there now, obviously, but that's in an example. <clears throat> you know, why is that? What was going on there that made StarCraft II such a big deal? And you can get, get into like, well, maybe the way it's discussed in the media. You know, it seems unfortunate here in the U.S. I don't know why we have this skepticism, but it's almost every time I hear something about a video game in the on the news, I kind of brace for impact because it's almost always some kind of negative story about, oh, these games are causing kids to be violent or people are wasting time is cutting into productivity you know, there's all this negative coverage that you just don't see in other places right you go to japan and it's a totally different culture as a well obviously I mean, that, that's true obviously but the attitudes about gaming they're very different uh, than here same thing with comics uh, ontology is the philosophy of games so this is where you get into like the logical realm and you know, if you really like these questions, like, what is a game? How do we define a game? At what point does something become a game? Uh, the, you know, the questions along those lines, that would be... They, they, ontology is the study of being, basically, but I would just say some kind of philosophical approach would fit into this box. And then this last one is a little bit weird, but it's the metrics. Now, so what we find with games is that there's all these tools built into them, especially modern games, where you can get data... If you go to Steam, you could see like how many hours you've played a game. Uh, but you can go beyond that, and a lot of game developers do, especially on these uh, massive multiplayer online games. I mean, they are accumulating just terabytes, <laughs> whatever's bigger than a terabyte. <laughs> you know, all of this data, like who, what are people saying, and what are, you know, what are people doing at this spot? Now, you know, I remember the, the Telltale games, uh, every now and then they would say, you make a decision. And then at the end of the game, it would show you like a sheet or a screen, and it would say that 12% of players decided to rescue Carl <laughs> instead of, uh, you know, Jeremy or whoever, just making stuff up. Uh, but it would show you that data. Those were examples of some metrics, you know, some uh, some metered stuff, you know, some stuff that was measured. Uh, and that might reveal things, interesting things about all these gamers. Uh, it's kind of hard to do that with other you know, other things if you think about it. Uh, certainly, baseball comes up a lot in that uh, context because a lot of baseball fans really get into, like, the statistics of it. And you look at a baseball card, and there's basically a st statistical information there. You know, how many hits and, uh, you know, what, some <clears throat> what somebody's career looked like with math. And we can do that even better with video games. We can really accumulate a lot of data. You know, not to jump into the esports, but you think about the clicks per minute. <laughs> like you can measure that pretty easily, actually. Uh, and then we have these two basic schools of thought: uh, formalism and situationism. So this might you might think about this as the you know, sort of the big question that you answer before you jump into a specific type of analysis, or what's the sort of bigger framework you're working from uh, when you're doing a when you're looking at a game. Uh, the formalism focuses on the game themselves, uh, the games themselves, or the game itself, these philosophical questions we've been talking about. Uh, the nature of the game, so I would say something like games is games, 
the form of a game, what are the rules of this game, what are the gameplay mechanics, how do you win, how do you lose, if it's co-op, you know, how do you work together, uh, what are the roles you can play in that. Uh, so if you like that sort of stuff, you'd probably come from that, you probably want to be part of this formalist school. And they mentioned this, this kind of famous within game studies, this division between the ludologists and the uh, uh, narratologists. Uh, the ludologists, they're the ones that really get into like the gameplay rules. And they say it really doesn't matter. Nothing else really matters. Espinar Seth is famous for saying that if you play Tomb Raider, who cares about Lara Croft? You know, you don't really even notice her. I mean, you, if you're playing the game, it's just she's kind of just the vehicle. She's just the uh, the avatar. You control her. You don't really. Uh, that's sort of just standing in for you and somebody else. I forget was a Coster, and they were saying like in checkers, you might have a or chess, I guess you might talk about a king and a queen, but that's not. You could call them anything really. It's not really anything to do with actual royalty or his, you know, monarch monarchy. Those are just kind of convenient labels we put on stuff. It might make it cool, uh, but it really doesn't impact the game. And I think about when I grew up playing games in the 80s and especially the 90s, there would be a lot of uh, games, uh, little run and jump games, or the shoot 'em up games, and they'd be like, "Well, this is Terminator," or "This is," you know. I think there was even one about a uh, Beethoven, <laughs> the dog, <laughs> had a game, Bill and Ted the game. And it was all basically the same game, you know, the little guys jumping up on platforms and shooting things. And they could take, uh, basically take that same game and slap anything into it and change up the characters. Oh, now it's uh, Wayne's World. <laughs> and so that was kind of the ludologist point would be exactly, you know, it's just, that's not really important whether it's Bill and Ted or Wayne's World or, or E.T. or whatever. Uh, those are just the trappings. So that's a ludologist perspective. Uh, but then the narratologists kind of reversed that, and they said, well, actually, it's the opposite of what you're saying. It, it is really important that this is Wayne's world. You know, that's what makes this Wayne's world. <laughs> so it's got, you know, got these uh, characters from the uh, Wayne's world franchise. Uh, so you can sort of get the idea, right? And these, uh, they kind of butted heads a lot. You know, they might, maybe you wouldn't get into the journal if you didn't subscribe to one of these views. Uh, to me, I always thought it was a little bit silly try to sit, make out like it's just one or the other, either or. I mean, it's kind of, uh, I mean, they both make some good points, but to me, you had to combine those. Uh, and then the situation is I'm focusing on the analysis of game players or the culture at large. You know, where, what situation do we find ourselves in? Uh, I don't know. Situationism is kind of a weird term for this. Uh, I just think gaming as a social phenomenon, as a cultural practice, if you wanted to talk about esports, for example, I keep coming back to that as an easy example, uh, but you could talk about that as a cultural practice. You know, there's something going on uh, in South Korea called esports. You know, this is in the, everybody's playing. Very late, I think I'm trying to think of the year. This must have been like late '90s, I guess. Uh, it's this sort of cultural phenomenon of uh, StarCraft II. Uh, so you could really get into a lot there without really going into like. StarCraft II's rules or the story behind StarCraft II or the characters in that game or anything. You know, that might all be completely beside the point. Uh, what you really want to look at is this, the impact that it's had on that culture and try to explain that. All right, a lot of material packed into this, but of course these are questions we'll be exploring throughout the rest of this book. Uh, so thank you very much for watching this. I would appreciate it if you would ask a question or post a comment. And I hope you enjoyed that and see you next time.